A while ago, I released an episode called Mbira Kalimba, and I got quite a bit of flack for it. And I really appreciate all the comments I got. This is what this is all about. We're always learning. This is kind of a redux episode. I wanted to set the record straight. I wanted to go and iron out a few of the things that I was unclear about and a few of the things that I got wrong. But before we get started, in that episode, I was such a lazy ass, I didn't bother to tune it before I played it for you. The Embira anyway, the others were all fine. Um, so I want to show you quickly how I tune it and how it sounds tuned. Okay, so here's the tuning chart quickly. Um, this is a Zavadzimu type of Embira, which is a traditional Shona instrument from Zimbabwe. Um, there are other types and tuning structures, but this is probably the most common type you're going to find. Um, they're very often tuned in G, and as you will notice, this is G mixolydian mode. So to tune it, you're going to need a tuner, um, and you may need a clip as well for the tuner. Uh, tuners may not always pick up the vibrations, so you can just attach it to anywhere. And we'll start with the bottom note, which is supposed to be a G. It's a bit high, so what you want to do, take your hammer and just a good old screwdriver, flat nose screwdriver. Okay, so the way to do this is... The note is divided into two parts, basically, by this bridge over here. And here's the longer part of the note, and there is the shorter part of the note. Um, so if you want the note to go down in pitch, you need the longer part of the note to be longer. So I'm going to push this out a bit so that the longer part gets longer, and the shorter part will obviously get shorter. There we go. Perfect. Um, this note should be a B, and it's pretty close, lift it up, could be a tiny bit higher, I may just give it a slight tap, perfect, this should be a C, it's a bit high, so again, you push it in from the top, and just a light tap. Still too high. That's probably too low now. Yep. So just a little tap from this side. That's good enough for jazz. So as you can see, basically giving the note more on this side of the bar will make it go lower in pitch and pushing it up to that side of the bar will make it go higher in pitch. That's the beauty of these instruments, is they're not perfect and your tuning is never going to be absolutely perfect. So I got a ton of comments from people. So I reached out to Andrew Tracy, who is the son of Hugh Tracy, um, probably the world authority in academic terms anyway, on this instrument and its history. And so he's helped me go through all these points and clarify what I got wrong and what I got right. Number one. I called it an instrument from South Africa. And actually, I put that in the title of the video. That's not accurate. This instrument comes from Zimbabwe. And indeed, in the video, I go on to explain how this instrument is the instrument of the Shauna, and it comes from the Zambezi River Valley. And once you put it on Facebook business, it doesn't let you take the title down or change the title. So I'm stuck with that title on Facebook. Uh, on YouTube, I was able to change the title. So all those Zimbabweans who got angry with me, you had every right to, and hopefully I am correcting that mistake here. 
The second thing I got flack for was that I said that this instrument originated around 3,000 years ago, made with bamboo tines. So I asked Andrew about this, and here is what he had to say, and I'm quoting here. It is accepted that bamboo or cane keyed in bearers may have been invented in the Cameroon, Gabon uh, region. But elsewhere in Africa, particularly in the Zambezi Valley and Angola, they are much more likely to have been first made from iron. So there you have it from someone who has studied this a lot more than most of us have. Now the other thing that people really took offense to was that I said that mbiras were made out of taking railway sleeper nails and hammering them. Now while that is not technically untrue, I painted the picture that that is a very common part of the lineage of the mbira, and that is not true. However, when I put this to Andrew Tracy, he said that because smelting iron is a very difficult process, as more materials became commonplace in everyday life, like railway sleepers, bicycle saddle springs, spokes, bicycle spokes, you know, car springs, the ribs of an umbrella, for example, nails, fencing wire, and people would more commonly take those and just beat them into shape, much easier than smelting iron. But Andrew goes on to say that telegraph pole wires, for example, had a reputation for making really good tines, uh, to the point where his father, Hugh Tracy, would comment that... Uh, whenever he saw a telegraph pole um, bending over or, or laying over to a side, there must be a good beer maker around. And the other thing I got a lot of flack for was the examples that I listed, and I only listed two, Oliver Mtukudzi and Thomas Mapfuma. Now, people rightly pointed out that those guys, even though they used Mbira um, or Kalimba in some of their work, were not really known as Kalimba or Mbira players. My bad, but as I said to people, you know, when trying to introduce my wife to jazz, I didn't start out with John Coltrane. I started out maybe with Kenny G. Um, so this was kind of the thinking about why um, I mentioned those two names. But I want to set the record straight and list some of the monster Mbira players that are legends. Starting out with Stella Chueshe. Now, I've seen her here in LA performing. She's amazing. From Zimbabwe. Another great is Dumasani Marere. Now, he actually taught at the University of Washington in Seattle for many, many years and left such a legacy there that to this day, they have a annual festival of Mbiras. It's a four-day festival and there are an entire herd of American kids who have learned to play the Mbira because of him. Um, so that's an amazing legacy. And he's also a well-known composer. Kronos Quartet have, in fact, recorded a couple of his pieces on, I think it was called um, Pieces of Africa, that album. It's a lovely uh, Kronos Quartet album. Chiwaniso Mereri is another famous player, sadly departed now, but she was Dumasani's daughter. She was born, I believe, in Seattle and then moved back to Zimbabwe and sort of made her name using the Mbira in more a fusion context. And then there is Efat Wajuru, perhaps the greatest, some would think who sadly passed away in 2001. But what a great player. There are a couple of albums I'd like to recommend. One is called Rhythms of Life. And then there are two albums he did actually with Dumasani Marere, who I just mentioned, called Shauna Spirit and then Masters of the African Mbira. All of those incredible works. I've been listening to them while I'm out hiking and it's just transportive stuff. Beautiful. So I hope this goes a little ways in setting the record straight. I really appreciated all the comments that I got from you. I loved all of it because it all made me think and go and research more. And so I now know more about this than I did before. So thank you. And thank you very much to Andrew Tracy with the International Library of African Music in Grahamstown for his help and guidance in this episode. This instrument is freaking awesome. It is well worth the effort and all the attention. We're always learning. I'll catch you on the next one.